Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science at Home webinar series on COVID-19. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock. I am your host for their series and the Senior Policy Advisor at the Institute for Science and Policy. Um, I think this is episode 15 for those of you counting, so thank you for tuning in. Um, a huge thanks to our partners at the Colorado School of Public Health and our dear friend, Dean Samet. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, as a reminder, we have two audiences joining us today. We have those of you here on Zoom. Um, good morning. Go ahead and open that chat feature. That's going to be where you ask your questions of our panelists. Um, you can also go ahead and let us know where you're watching from. We love to see all those different places around Colorado and beyond that you've tuned in from. Uh, good morning to our Facebook Live audience as well. Over there, you can use that comment feature to type in your questions. Um, we'll have a couple presentations today, and as we get to the end, I will work to incorporate some of your questions into our discussion. Um, so we'd love to see them. I do not get to all of your questions, um, but do please feel free to type those in as we go throughout. So today we're going to be taking a little bit of an international view and perspective of the pandemic and looking to our neighbors to the south. Our two guests are going to be sharing stories from Latin and Central American communities discussing some of the challenges that they're facing and ways that they've been managing the pandemic. Um, we're also going to hear about potentially some commonalities between their methods and what is happening here in the U.S. response. Uh, so not only is COVID-19 creating this public health crisis internationally, um, it's also pointing to some long-standing inequities that we see um, and creating, of course, as we're experiencing here, some massive economic um, contraction. So I'm going to show here a quick slide just to paint the picture um, of what we're looking at. So this here is a view, um, a global view of COVID-19 deaths and mortality um, across the globe. This data is from, the latest update is from last Friday. Um, I think one of the more important ways of thinking about COVID-19 and its impacts and its burden is looking at the mortality rate. Um, as you can kind of see here from this figure, and we'll get more details from our speakers, you see hot spots and some really intense mortality rates in the Americas as well as in Europe. Um, some of that, of course, is going to be due to the fact that there are you have see higher mortality in our older populations, um, but also you see higher mortality rates and increases when hospitals become overwhelmed or potentially countries have fewer resources to manage um, the pandemic. So today we have two distinguished guests joining us, um, bringing very unique perspectives um, to this topic. Um, our first guest is Dr. Mauricio Hernandez Avila, who is currently the Director of Economic and Social Benefits at the Mexican Institute of Social Security and a physician from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He completed his master's and doctorate degrees in epidemiology at Harvard and he completed his medical residency specializing in pathology at the National Institute of Nutrition. He has served as a former Undersecretary of Prevention and Health Promotion of the Ministry of Health, where he coordinated the crisis in Mexico caused by H1N1. He was also the Director General of the National Institute of Public Health. He is an international scholar and a member of the National Academies of Medicine in the US and in Mexico. Our second guest joining us today is Dr. Edwin Asturias. He is the Jules Amer Chair in Community Pediatrics at Children's Hospital Colorado and Professor of Pediatrics and Infectious Disease at the CU School of Medicine and a Professor of Epidemiology and Director of the Latin American Projects for the Center for Global Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. That is one of the longer titles I think I've had to read so far. <laughs> he is a native to Guatemala where he received his medical training um, at the University of San Carlos and was boarded in pediatrics and infectious diseases at the University of Colorado and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His career is focused on establishing the epidemiology of vaccines for preventable diseases in low and middle income countries of Central America, as well as focusing on vaccine safety and immunization for children. He has served as a member and vice chair of the Global Advisory Committee of Vaccine Safety from WHO. He is now the coordinator for the Advanced Vaccinology course of the University of Geneva and Foundation Miro in France and president of the Board of Colorado Children's Immunization Coalition. 
Uh, Dr. Osteris is currently in Guatemala advising and assisting in managing the COVID-19 crisis there for the president. Um, so good morning. Welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Dr. Hernandez, would you like to get us started? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank the Institute of Science and Policy for the invitation and uh, to my good friend, Jonathan Samet for uh, giving us this uh, opportunity to share what we are doing in, and how we're seeing things in, in Mexico. So I will show you some slides really, really fast to put you in, in, in context. Uh, the, well, you know that uh, January 7, uh, China confirmed the first case. Uh, we are uh, more or less 20, uh, one month away from uh, the first case of uh, COVID-19 in the US. Our first community at, at Quar case was on February 28. Uh, we did have a number of imported uh, cases, uh, 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 some of them from, from Colorado. Uh, and uh, we started our lockdown measures uh, beginning in uh, March uh, 23. And uh, from there on, we have uh, been limited activities, uh, uh, those to uh, an essential nature. And on May 30, we start uh, opening again uh, to normal life. And uh, from June uh, 1st, we have been on the reactivation, the economic reactivation. So uh, let me give you a small uh, update of, of how we are doing. You see the two epidemic curves on, on, the, on the left side. One is of cases, and the other one is uh, uh, on uh, mortality. Uh, we have performed over a million uh, tests. Uh, we have one uh, low rate of testing of 925 per 100,000. Uh, and we uh, have a total of uh, 417,000 uh, positive cases uh, already detected in Mexico. Uh, we have uh, a total of uh, 50,000, 56,000 deaths. Uh, although uh, a new estimation, uh, we, we think we might be close to the 100,000 deaths uh, in, in Mexico. Next one, please. Just to give you a perspective on, on uh, comparing two sites uh, in Mexico and the United States, I'm, I'm here uh, comparing the Colorado uh, state with Mexico City. Uh, Colorado has uh, 1.7 million, 5.7 million, Mexico City 8.9. And here we, we can see some of, of the differences. Uh, we, we see that Colorado has done uh, almost uh, four times more tests than Mexico. And uh, you, you have detected uh, 53,000 cases, while in Mexico we have detected 85,000 cases. Uh, this means that uh, most likely uh, we are not detecting as much as we would like in Mexico. And that's why we see these differences in, in the graph where Colorado seems to be higher than, than Mexico. But this depends very much on the, on the testing. The, the next one, please. Well, uh, following our 70 days of, of lockdown, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about this because this is what is under our responsibility in Mexico, we start easing restrictions uh, with a gradual strategy in name, as in many parts of the world, the new uh, normality. Uh, we have implemented a four color uh, traffic light uh, type uh, um, semaphorization that is uh, being updated every two weeks. And that uh, traffic light uh, determines the activity linked, linked to the transmission rates. So we have uh, maximum alert uh, level where only uh, essential industry is allowed to uh, uh, work and at a reduction level of 25%. Then we have high where uh, essential industry can work at 100% and other industries might start uh, also incorporating intermediate uh, risk and then a low risk when we, uh, uh, everybody comes back, especially schools, which uh, all schools are linked uh, 
uh, except except uh, daycares are linked to the low the low level. How is this uh, color determined? Is the, the color is determined by indicators of the level of health risk? Mainly two indicators: the hospital occupation, the number of available beds, and the rate at which are getting occupied. And on the other hand, the transmission rate at the community which is, has to do with the increase of number of cases and the percent of positivity seen at this, at this level. So the, here, the, basically, the main uh, lessons that we are learning is the politically complicated issues uh, arising from changing from a federal operated traffic light to a state operated traffic light. And I, I will go a little bit on further detail on, on that. Can you show the, the next one? Well, what we have been doing uh, to support uh, this uh, uh, reopening of, of activity. Well, why in Mexico is a new normal? Uh, it's a new normal because we are returning to a, an environment uh, never implemented before in Mexico that has to do with the protection standards. We uh, have never implemented uh, this type of, of protecting protection measurements. And uh, this is changing the game for industries. Now uh, employers are obliged to adapt uh, to infection control strategies uh, based on a hazard assessment uh, and here, we have put forward for uh, the different industries a combination of engineering and administrative controls. And also employers did to train workers uh, because as I said, this uh, was never implemented in Mexico uh, before. So how we have been responding? Uh, first, we did a call to all chambers, unions to develop a compromise to support this new health protection. We developed a mandatory interim guidance to help prevent workers' exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And uh, we have developed also a surveillance system. And we help uh, industries and employers uh, by offering a massive online open courses uh, for workers and industry and safety managers. Um, the next one, please. Here I, 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 I'm uh, uh, showing you uh, part of our platform for surveillance. In this platform, since May 25, we have now registered uh, over 100,000 industries. Uh, this might not seem to be a high rate compared to the 1 million industries that Mexico has, but we are registering mostly uh, uh, um, larger industries. So these 109,000 industries account for over 9 million workers, uh, which represents 44% of the insured workers that we have. So in this platform, we have industries uh, categorized by different activity levels. The, the framework is a little bit complicated, but let me show you uh, the power of this, of this platform. Here, uh, you see uh, an epidemiological graph in which uh, in the axis we have cases and the epidemiological uh, week. So the, the graph starts, uh, can, can you move the cursor? Yes. The graph starts in uh, January 2019. The uh, magenta or purple graph that you see represents our influenza, um, uh, um, our influenza uh, temporary disability claims. Uh, and then we move over the year, that's the, uh, the winter period from 2019-20. Uh, and then you can see the green bars uh, where we can see now the excess of uh, COVID-19 claims for temporary uh, dis respiratory disability. So, so far we have received uh, over uh, 255,000 temporary disability claims for uh, 
clinical uh, cases uh, that resemble COVID. Now, I just want to point out to the last weeks uh, that after an increase in uh, claims that uh, are linked to the reactivation, we are finally seeing a lowering of the level of claims. Now, in the other part of the graph, uh, here you can see uh, the industries uh, classified to help us find uh, industries of the same size but uh, who have a different behavior in terms of temporary disability claims that they are submitting to our system. So you have on one uh, side, uh, maquiladora industry with a clear outbreak uh, of uh, COVID-19. Uh, Here uh, you have, uh, 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 maybe you don't see the scale, but it's about 30 cases uh, per week. Uh, and then you, we are comparing it with another uh, industry, same uh, area, same uh, number of workers, and you can see the differences. Now, what do we do with this uh, uh, information? Well, we share this information with the Ministry of Work, and they visit uh, these industries and, and help them to comply. If they don't comply, then they, they are uh, closed. Uh, in, a, in a third uh, visit. So we are uh, doing uh, a surveillance that is, is very direct and very efficient. Now, what we did to support uh, industry and businesses to uh, train their workers is we offer this uh, uh, MOOC uh, platform, uh, which is open 24 hours a day, and it can uh, take over 50,000 uh, simultaneous users. So far, for the whole uh, COVID activity, we have trained close to 9 million users. We know that they, it's, it's been efficient because uh, we asked them to do a test, a pre-course test and a post-course test, and we see that more than 80% of participants uh, take uh, that both tests, so they mean that they comply with the course, and we see that there is an increment in the scores uh, per se. Now, for the area of, of work return, uh, we open also a section here uh, to train specifically workers and plant managers in order to compile with our guidelines. And here, we have already trained uh, 2.6 million workers, and it's increasing every day. And we have trained already 37,000 um, monitors which are placed at uh, industries. So in this regard, uh, we have uh, trained almost 2.8 million in this, in this strategy all, all over. The next one, please. Uh, just uh, to let you know, because the, the travel restrictions are going to be is uh, also between our countries. Uh, Mexico has been also working very hard to reshape our tourism because it accounts for 8.7% uh, of the GDP and uh, 2.3 million jobs. And we have also been training uh, tourism industry workers. Uh, so far we have trained 18,000 and we are just starting uh, this week. So. Uh, Mexico is refocusing in this industry to make it safe and to make it again attractive for the rest of the world. Uh, next one, please. Uh, two issues that I would like to bring to you, uh, which we all all face uh, here, and is is uh, the issues testing uh, with testing and uh, the protective uh, personal equipment. Uh, testing has been very difficult in Mexico, uh, specifically because we depend on uh, imports uh, from the United States and there are some restrictions. Uh, and currently in our own health system that provides health to 60 million Mexicans, we, have, we are struggling with Roche diagnostics because uh, they cannot comply with the, the uh, reagents that we need to increase our number of tests, and also with CFAs, uh, which is a gene experts uh, uh, system, and we are facing really severe bottlenecks to do our own testing. 
Also, uh, doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers are facing the prospect of working without personal protective equipment. And this is because we have limited national stockpiles and uh, also states in Mexico uh, have not uh, stockpiled uh, this type of, of supplies. We are worried about the vaccine uh, during the H1N1 epidemic. Uh, just to give you a comparison, the US and Canada had already vaccinated most of their population when Mexico received its uh, first shipping of, uh, of vaccines. So here uh, we need to do an effective management uh, uh, on, on non-pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical interventions so that all countries will, will have access uh, to, these, to these benefits. We, we must consider uh, also how patenting uh, and pricing can influence uh, the development capacity and access to these pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Uh, the next one. Well, just to close, I uh, would like to tell you that uh, we have the idea that uh, countries were forced to launch uh, uh, to, to, uh, the response as it unfolded. Uh, despite the warning from the scientific community that uh, globally we were not prepared to respond as, uh, for an epidemic of this magnitude. Here I'm showing you a report from the Institute of Medicine, now the Academy of Medicine, uh, that came out in, in 2016, uh, alerting that we were really not ready uh, and, and we reached uh, 2020 in the same, uh, with the same level of uh, we, we are, I think, reassured when we hear authorities that are, are following uh, the signs. Uh, however, scientific knowledge uh, seldom leads to a specific course of political action. And, and we've seen here uh, many uh, issues between, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, disagreements between economy and, and public health that need to be uh, handled in a more effective uh, way. The next one, please. So I think that uh, COVID-19 in Mexico has exposed uh, the lack of preparedness that we had. Uh, we, uh, I think, had very limited stockpiling. The Mexican health system has weaknesses uh, very important which are segmentation and uh, fragmentation that in this case uh, of this pandemic uh, it, it really affected the efficient use of, of, of resources and then as we uh, unfold this new normality we we think that this new normality might not be protectingly all our members of, of, of our society Mexico has a, a high percentage of workers, almost 50% of workers, that uh, work on a minimum income. And this minimum income is really obtaining on a day-to-day -day basis. So this, uh, I think, is a limit uh, for this uh, new normality that we need to, to think about it. Because, you know, basically, complying with the new normality yeah, or with the non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, intervention, well, uh, it's only if you have the means uh, to, to comply. So I, I close this intervention, I think, uh, uh, saying that it's okay to allow ourselves to change and it's okay not to be comfortable with what is, is going on. We, we need to do and to analyze our first part of response uh, to see uh, how can we improve and how can we improve in the short term. So thank you very much for your attention and I remain attentive for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez, very much. Um, let's turn this over uh, to Dr. Astorius to give another perspective and then we'll head into Q&A. Good morning, how are you, Edwin? Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Natural Museum of uh, the Museum of Natural History and Science uh, in Colorado, as well as to the School of Public Health, and especially the invitation of Dr. S uh, uh, Samet uh, for this. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Hernandez has already 
giving you a great perspective from Mexico and it's, it's a good representation of what's happening in many countries. Uh, I'll try to give a perspective from the Central America, but not uh, without first uh, looking into uh, Latin America per se. So uh, when one counts only number of deaths, uh, Brazil is now second to the world in terms of number of total death uh, from COVID-19 follow my Mexico, uh, which Mauricio has presented very clearly, and Peru is standing at ninth. Uh, so in many ways, Latin America is the sec second largest epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide, uh, uh, just behind the United States. And, uh, and here is a, is a graph uh, published in El País, uh, uh, which sort of gives you the number of cases uh, uh, that have sort of drawn through Latin America. The one that you see more interesting is Peru, uh, which was sort of trailing along many of the Latin American countries and recently has a, seen a, a huge acceleration of their, of their number of cases. Um, the perspective from Central America is quite unique. Um, and uh, we have a, we are about six countries, uh, each one different in terms of their health systems, their disparities, uh, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity and I think it, it provides a, a good sort of lens into Latin America in many ways. So you see that uh, Panama and Costa Rica were the first countries to sort of start seeing cases of uh, COVID-19 much earlier than the rest of Central America. That was due to their, them having a hub for tourism, either Panama with their airport as well as Costa Rica for the tourism. And, uh, and of course you see uh, there the graph from Panama number of cases per million population is a country that has reported the most cases. Uh, and that is due mainly to their uh, in incredible amount of testing that they have done. Uh, they are the country with most testing per uh, thousand uh, inhabitants. And, uh, and you can see how they basically reach a peak uh, uh, back in, in June, the end of June, and have now since stabilized. Costa Rica had a quite a, quite a unique uh, process. They had a first wave of cases uh, in the first uh, two months of their outbreak, then were able to control the first wave very well. And you have seen now that they have accelerated to escalate the number of cases. Uh, uh, very much above uh, the, what we call the countries in the triangle, North Triangle of Central America, which are El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. This is not due uh, to the issue that there are less cases in these other countries, is that the testing it has been much more difficult. Um, so here's a, how it compares the, the death per million population. So this is a, the, the case fatality rate, if you want. And, uh, and you see again, Panama uh, being uh, at the peak, uh, they, they were quite stable at, at the very beginning, but then now uh, with the increase of cases, they had a, a, a huge amount of, uh, of disease. Uh, Costa Rica, on the other hand, has shown, uh, you know, that they have increased the number of deaths, but actually when you look at, at the, at the uh, rates, uh, they keep very low rates of, uh, of uh, mortality compared to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, uh, which has experienced uh, quite an amount. And this is reflected in the case fatality rate. The, the country with the highest fatality rate in the, in the whole uh, area has been Honduras. Honduras traditionally has had probably one of the, the more uh, uh, delayed health systems in, in, the, in the area and they showed a, a tremendous amount of mortality that again uh, got stable uh, after uh, mid-June or so. Uh, Guatemala now is the country within Central America with a, a stable mortality rate, but yet we're seeing a, a higher rates. A, our system, health system is a, quite unique, has been actually lagging behind in every aspect of the indicators. We have a very low number of physicians per population, per capita, a, the lowest probably number of beds per capita in the whole region, and certainly a health system that is quite despair in terms of how uh, it is approached. And, and uh, uh, there is no data for all the countries, but, it, but this is what I was mentioning before. Panama has been uh, the country with the highest number of testing, and they really were able to increase their capacity along with Costa Rica. El Salvador invested very clearly at, at, the, at the beginning with it, but Guatemala was one of the countries that really couldn't get their act together in the first two or three months to sort of get testing going. And this is reflected in this graph. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, how the testing was at the very beginning. We had our first case on the 13th of March, and you can see the very low numbers of testing that we had for many, many, many months. Uh, and until basically uh, when I came here, we put together a strategy to increase their, our capacity for testing. And since about mid-June, we have been steadily increasing. We're about now a 0.3 to 0.4 a, a test per a thousand population per day, which is a, what, what I call the minimum that we are allowing ourselves to do. Some areas of the country, like the central metropolitan, metropolitan region, is doing at what 0.8 uh, per thousand per day, but other areas of Guatemala still need a lot of uh, work. And, and as uh, Mauricio reflected, we got to a point of uh, uh, about 40 to 45 percent positive testing, and recently we have seen a, a decrease in the in the percentage of testing uh, positive in the country. So lessons learned from Latin America from my standpoint, I think if you look at most countries in Latin America, those countries that took early consistent actions based on science have done much better. And I will say that in those one can sort of look at Uruguay, Paraguay, Costa Rica, uh, and some other countries in the middle that really did a, a good job. Uh, certainly countries that had a robust universal healthcare system, especially based on primary healthcare, have had lower mortality and really have been able to tackle this epidemic very well. The upscaling of testing, as Mauricio reflected, it has been critical, but also very difficult for Latin America. Many countries didn't have the decentralization of their, of their uh, laboratory capability. Uh, many hospitals didn't have the the ability to sort of go and test for PCR, and they had to they, they had to sort of uh, rethink their whole systems. Uh, what I call the boxing in strategy, uh, which is a, a way of sort of a, a controlling the virus, which includes testing, isolation, tracing, and quarantine, has been a very simple and clear strategy for the population to understand. Uh, in many countries in Latin America, uh, trying to convey that strategy to the population hasn't been easy. And I think the boxing strategy has worked well. And finally, I think as Mauricio reflected, the gradual reopening of the economy uh, has been shown to be better, uh, especially if we try to keep away the reopening of schools, bars, and large gatherings, especially in some countries. Uh, we are very cognizant of the need for school reopening but we also uh, know that those are going to be, uh, uh, given the past history, a large focus of, uh, of re reigniting the outbreaks. And, they, and I think there's a lot of countries looking into the strategies and lessons learned from Europe and the United States in terms of how you do that in a way that doesn't fuel you know, a larger outbreaks within the, um, the state. And so I'll leave it at that uh, and be open for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you both very much. Um, we have a ton of questions coming in from the folks, but so we'll try to take on some of these big ones that we have. Um, in addition to testing, um, what are some of the preventative strategies that have been implemented across your regions or your countries that you've been focused in Guatemala and Mexico? Mask wearing, that sort of thing. What does that look like where you're operating? Um, Edwin, would you start for me, please? And then uh, Mauricio, would you follow up? Sure. Uh, I can tell you, at least from Guatemala, one of the most important strategies that delayed uh, our uh, outbreak uh, that didn't come until late May, beginning of June, was the, the implementation of a, a mandate, mandates for universal masking. Uh, and that was uh, sort of implemented in Guatemala a month after the, the first case, even when they where the World Health Organization and many countries were not recommending that as a, as a strategy. In my look at the evidence so far, I think masking is one, masks are one of the most important strategies that we can have. Even I think there's data now that, that, that is, is as, as good as sort of a, a complete lockdown of a country. And in many of these countries where the economy really cannot resist a lockdown for that long, uh, the, the mass, universal uh, use of masks has been crucial. We have increased it. We have been sort of following the informal markets here, which are a good sort of a way of looking at the, at the lower income population. And uh, we went from having a, back in May, 90% of the population in those markets uh, wearing a mask 
uh, but only 60% wearing it correctly to most recently about a week or week and a half ago, 98% uh, of the people in those markets uh, wearing a mask and 90% of them using it correctly. So I think that really has helped uh, tremendously in that process. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I definitely agree with Edwin. And in Mexico, we, we had a, a difficult start with uh, universal recommended, recommending universal masking. And that was because uh, we had a very short supply for, of EPP for medical doctors. And we uh, were struggling to keep our hospitals and clinics uh, with a full supply of EPPs. So I think uh, that's why we did not recommend it, uh, universal masking. Uh, further on, on the epidemic, we, we have been uh, supporting it and uh, we are working on it. One thing that we think is very efficient, but in Mexico has not been speed up is contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing needs uh, resources, needs a lot of testing. And as I mentioned, our testing system experienced really severe bottlenecks uh, with the restrictions and uh, the very complicated markets that we, we were facing. So those two issues were not really, I think, well uh, put in place in Mexico. However, uh, from the National Institute of Social Security, we implemented an online uh, um, uh, way to get your uh, uh, re registry for your temporary capacity for respiratory disease. And uh, we were very successful in uh, uh, helping people to stay at home and to quarantine without needing to go to the doctor, without needing to go to the bank to collect your uh, uh, your payment. So, so that I think saves us uh, close to one point and a half million trips uh, in in the cities. Thank you. Um, we have an interesting question here. It kind of builds on a few folks' question. Um, I'm going to bring up the end part of it too, which um, someone pointed out and noted that, for example, in Mexico, um, there's a high number of uh, people from the country who have diabetes. So we have pre-existing health conditions, um, potentially, you know, which make people more susceptible, of course, you know, to catching COVID in, in that higher risk category. Um, so the questions to both of you, um, thinking about those factors around everything else you said, if there was one strategy that you could change right now that you are not doing based on lessons from other countries or lessons yourself that you've learned since the start of this, what would that change in that strategy be? Um, I'm looking to see who wants to go first on that. Mauricio, would you like to take that one first and then Edwin? This, this is a very relevant question because it, it affects you in a, in a double-sided. When, when uh, you are a worker that has diabetes and then you are uh, linked to a vulnerable policy, then you might stay at home. And we have recommended this uh, to happen. So many workers with uh, chronic disease are staying at home. Now, this also has a cost because they have to stay with full salary and it's the employer who pays this, this salary. So we have been working to, first of all, to uh, ask these workers to come to our health facilities because we are the health providers of them and to get control of the disease. It's, it's been shown that if you are on control of your disease, if your glucose levels are on, the, on a good level, then you are not a higher risk of, of uh, 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 of having a severe uh, manifestation of COVID-19. Uh, so I think we, we had to struggle with uh, um, how to reach these, uh, these people to help them to comply with uh, and to control the disease. So the strategy that I will bring in will be telemedicine. We, we, we felt very short of access to, for these uh, uh, people with uh, living with these conditions. So, I will implement telemedicine really heavily. And perhaps from my end, uh, I think in, in complementing Mauricio's sort of a, a thought, 
Uh, if I had to sort of, uh, uh, you know, restart the, the, the response to this pandemic, I will use two important things that I think uh, we knew worked before, but we thought as we were rushing to sort of, a, 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 you know, get the hospitals ready, we forgot to primary health care and population health were crucial for this. And I think what we have learned recently is that, yeah, hospitals are tremendously important for holding the consequences of this infection. But if we were able to sort of uh, tackle people or sort of go to people early on, uh, either vulnerable populations or so, and try to get them, uh, you know, the right treatments and the right care early on, closer to their home, it was much better than actually waiting for them to show up at the hospitals and sort of uh, uh, being complicated. So. I think once again, I think COVID-19 is telling us that, that primary health care and population health are crucial for any response. Thank you. If I may add something is, Mexico has a very high level of chronic disease. So if you decide to make a, say a recommendation of staying at home for hypertension and diabetes, you will send home 30% of the workforce. If you include obesity, uh, then you uh, increase uh, that by 40%. So it, it also has, uh, I mean, in terms of pro health protection and economic dilemmas that we, we face here. Let's maybe build on that uh, last point there, Mauricio. Um, so a lot of folks, you know, point out in our chat and in many conversations we have that it's, there's trade-offs but there's also challenges as you navigate public health and safety with an, an economy and closing an economy and potentially reopening an economy. So we saw a lot from Mauricio on some of that. Um, Edwin, could you talk a little bit about what are some of those fine balancing acts that are being talked about right now between public health safety and, ha and keeping the economy going? Yeah, and I think in Latin America, those uh, balances are different depending on the country. There are countries, again, which had a very robust uh, health systems and also at the same time had a more organized economy in a way of, uh, uh, you know, being able to lock down completely. I think Mexico and, and most of the Central American countries, as, as well as some of the South American countries, uh, are similar to Guatemala in the sense that, uh, for example, our reliance on agriculture is very high. And therefore, agricultural workers were able to continue to work because distancing was much easier there and the ability for them not to sort of uh, gather was important. However, uh, the cities and the urban areas really got hit very hard by this. And, and there we had to make a decision on uh, which were essential industries and commerce that needed to continue versus those that uh, we needed to wait for uh, in order to reactivate. Uh, I think uh, uh, in, in Guatemala, for example, we never had, a, uh, except for a few days, a uh, couple of times, uh, full lockdowns. And our learning through those full lockdowns was that, that the, the ability for the population to resist those lockdowns was very low. And so we needed to come up with a, a partial strategy of uh, sort of decreasing those uh, uh, the activity, the mobility without really hurting people. Uh, and I think so far has proven uh, that the balance is, is there. We haven't been hit by the second wave, so still more to come, but I, I think for the most part, uh, it has worked well. Mauricio, anything to add to that before? I've got one final question for both of you, but let me give you a chance to respond or add. Well, you know, we, we took decisions it, in, in Mexico uh, to reopen certain industries, which you, you can clearly say they are not essential for, for maintaining the living uh, and, and the work of government. We, we open, for example, all the automotive industry uh, that is linked uh, with the United States production changes. So, so we open the maquiladoras that are feeding parts or vehicles to the U.S. on the aerospatial, large trucks and automobile. And, and I think this is, this is good because then we, we work as a, as a, a total, no? as a complete whole uh, in the North America agreement. And, and we, that's why we work very closely with this, with this industry. It, that's when you see economy 
is being protected, you know, because uh, not opening in Mexico has uh, huge repercussions for for the industry in the in the in the U.S. Having said that, uh, we will have loved that the uh, you know companies that are doing tests like Roche and CFAID will provide our market with certain kind of priority, but that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a journalist there and wants to do a story, that would be great. <laughs> Sorry for the commercial. <laughs> That is actually where I was going with my last question, which is about coordination, right? We are a very mobile society, hence, you know what I mean, how this uh, pandemic has actually spread. But there's close coordination, of course, between the U.S. with Mexico and our other Latin American, Central American, and other neighbors. Um, that's, that's through businesses. It's through, you know, companies who have dual factories in places. It's through tourism. It's through people traveling. What sort of coordination are you seeing? Are, are we seeing good coordination, poor coordination? Where could we be doing better? And what should our audience be knowing about that coordination between our countries? I, mean, I think a lot of people are concerned about traveling or have questions about traveling. Well, we, we in, 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 say, in the part of North America, we have some mechanism, uh, NAPAPI, which is North, North American you know, collaboration for pandemia and influenza, has been working pretty well. We, we have had meetings very helpful uh, meetings, for example, uh, when we've uh, had our crisis for uh, personal protective equipment, we saw alternatives on how to recycle safely these EBPs because we were all, all facing similar problems in, in at least US and, and Mexico. So we've been working, I think, uh, pretty close together with the coordinations and uh, meetings, uh, I will tell you, every 15 days or so on sharing lessons and also information. This issue of the samples was uh, addressed in, 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 uh, in these uh, uh, meetings and we had a little response, but, uh, but we, we have addressed all this there. And I I'm really think that we had a very good coordination. Now, in terms of traveling, I hope that we are going to develop a safe traveling industry because as many Mexicans visit the US, Many U.S. citizens also visit uh, Mexico, so we need to work out the security protocols to make this activity safe again and uh, uh, to empower our economies. So I think from my end, I, I will say that, uh, uh, you know, the, the first uh, reaction of any government is uh, to protect their own population, and that really has uh, been uh, something that we have seen in other pandemics where uh, countries uh, look to themselves first before they looked into coordination. Now, uh, it has been uh, incredible the amount of coordination and help that has come from all the countries, especially for Latin America. I think the the strategy, the, the U.S., which has been the traditional, a, a more uh, you know natural partner of Latin America, in this case, given the response to their outbreak, has uh, really hampered their ability to sort of coordinate and collaborate with Latin America. We'll say. Uh, the amount of PPE that you have, the amount of testing that you need, uh, everything else has diverted away from uh, the traditional collaboration. So Latin America is now benefiting from partnerships with Europe as well as uh, Asia. So there has been a tremendous amount of help, for example, to Central America from China, Taiwan, and South Korea because they uh, have these large amounts of PPE as including testing that actually have been able to provide to the country. So in many ways, I think what we are seeing here is when a country as large as the United States uh, you know, is having trouble due to the epidemic, their ability to really coordinate with others is relatively uh, uh, diminished. And, um, and I will say from the, the industry of travel, it certainly Mexico as well as uh, Guatemala, Costa Rica and other places, which are hubs for tourism, uh, are going to need to look into that industry as a, as a crucial one for restarting economy because it's going to be quite important for uh, how we do that in a safe way that the traveler is feeling like they can come to the country and not necessarily get infected and also that they can come to this country and not bring in more importations of cases. Thank you both. I know how extremely busy you both are. And so I'm very grateful for the time you've given us today and your expertise and your thoughtful comments. Um, so thank you very much. It's been a pleasure getting to work with, with both of you. Um, so thank you for joining us today.
Um, a huge thank you to all of our audience as well for tuning in um, and staying tuned for our series as we go on. We have a couple more coming up in the works for August. We're going to talk about uh, the economy next week um, with Kelly Bruff and Richard Wobekind from CU and from the Denver Chamber joining us next week. Um, so thank you for tuning in today. As a reminder, you can find recordings of today's episode that we encourage you to share out to your networks and others. We also do written recaps for those of you who don't like to watch video recordings but want to see what we talked about, we'll have those available on the Institute website. Just go to institute.dmns.org. Um, and in the chat, we dropped a link for that, as well as links to all of our social media channels. A huge thank you to our partners at Colorado School of Public Health and Dr. John Samet for helping us bring in these two wonderful speakers. So uh, Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Arsuris, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, Dr. Samet. Thank you very much. And we look forward to see you again Bye-bye. Great. Best of wishes for your work ahead. Thank you.